So uh, welcome to the first lecture of our faculty exchange program. Uh, this is happening between the PG and Research Department of Department of English and the PG uh, Department of English of St. Joseph's College for Women in Alapura. And I'm, uh, I am Kuku Savior. I am the coordinator from this part of the world. And uh, thank you so much for joining us. As part of our uh, first lecture, Dr. Sonia J. Nair will be speaking to us on post-colonial literatures. She specializes in gender studies and culture studies. So uh, if you want to speak something, please go ahead, Geetu, ma'am. Right. So the title of our lecture here is Reading Postcolonial Literatures, A Historical Perspective. Okay. Reading Postcolonial Literatures, A Historical Perspective. Now, when you think about that, look at the amount of words that are located within this title. <coughs> Reading Postcolonial Literatures in plural, historical perspective okay so it is from here that our examination actually begins okay because to read something is not just an act of turning the pages because there are multiple literatures in multiple forms you could have movies you could have books of course there are paintings and more importantly there are our own lives okay which form ways of reading which allow us avenues of reading. So when you look at this word post-colonial, you know, uh, it's a very loaded term, understand? Because we have imagined that most of the world has been what we call a colony, correct? And the word colony is not a stranger to us, right? What, what are the various connotations of colony? Bees have colonies. Human beings live in colonies and <clears throat> at least uh, in certain parts of the world, the use of the word colony denotes possibly not such ideal conditions of living, right? We think gundas live in colonies, okay? And, and we're like, oh no, that's a colony area. We're not going there kind of a thing. So, but you know what? This perspective of colony as a less than desirable place to live or to go to is a perspective that has been informed by the kind of interactions that we have had. Okay, we'll come to that. Literatures. See, normally we study English language and literature. So why are we pluralizing it? Okay, it refers to those multiplicities, to those polyphonies that have, you know, perforated what we call literature today okay and historical it is always important to be able to delve or to go back to the past because it is there that the clues lie understand of what we are how we are and why we are the way we are today i have said this in a number of my uh, previous classes as well you know you just have to look at what you are wearing today and you will have a very good idea 
of your own history your thought processes your belief systems which were probably handed over to you which you inherited and then interpreted okay so you inherit a belief system and then you interpret it understand so it's all of these things that form our perspective what we inherit what we interpret understand so what exactly is post colonial studies okay now as is being said in the slide there post colonial studies looks to examine the processes that led to the formation of colonies and empires okay and apart from that see that would just make it a historical study uh, part for history but what we also examine are those practices which represent continuities of those very imperial tendencies through the process of neo colonialism see in the british times things were you know kind of there was a formula they go they they invade uh, then they sign trade relations or and then they invade as the case may be and then what do they do they start those kind of uh, give and take exchange then they try to have a say in the governance the ruling in the cultural systems and customs of the people understand but the thing is that neo colonialism works in yet another way understand it works in ways that we are unable to discern or really see as as quite obvious okay now that could be through the presence as well as the influence of various multinational corporations okay uh, people uh, you know who have been trying to get intellectual property from us understand lay claim to what is your historical or what is uh, you know your legacy these are the ways that neo colonialism works understand so through the agency of economics through the agency of business through the agency of political negotiations neo colonialism continues to function so post colonial uh, studies also examines these methods through which imperial practices are still propagated i don't know how many of you know but uh, you know at least in the in the early 90s and the late up to the early 2000s all the 90% of the groundwater in the philippines was polluted 90% of groundwater in the philippines was polluted okay so uh, people were you know kind of mixing formula milk for their babies in this particular water itself okay because philippines used to be a us colony for a very long time they still have an uh, a navy base over there understand so whatever is american culture has been gradually absorbed into the filipino mentality okay so those patterns those ideas of consumer culture have also been absorbed so they used to be feeding their children formula milk formula milk requires what formula powder and water right so this water is it's polluted so then the filipino government put across a massive campaign promoting breastfeeding okay they said breastfeed your babies it's healthy and you know they they laid out all of those medical reasons and finally the us government called up the filipino government and told them stop the campaign because milk powder sales are being affected this is a classic example of neo colonialism imperial practices being propagated through neo colonialism now apart from you know interrogating these processes of neo colonialism what post colonial studies also does is examine the ways that human and non human subjectivities identities nations resistance movements and governance practices are shaped as a result of these continuing practices which means that it also assesses the ways and means through which neo colonialism or even you know our our colonial uh, uh, impact has been propagated on our bodies on our belief systems on our social economic political and very importantly 
ecological patterns. Understand, the trees that we plant, the trees that we cut down, our ideas of you know, what was dispensable in nature, what was non-dispensable in nature, all of these had been largely influenced by imperial practices. Understand, forests after forests of teak were cut down to build imperial palaces, imperial furniture, and what was planted instead was acacia, which as you know, is a tree that the governments are begging us to cut down at this point of time because of the amount of water that it consumes. Understand? So what, what histories, what stories are inscribed on your bodies through the agency of language? Okay? Through the agency of language, that is what post-colonial studies examines. Are we clear up to this point? Now here is a painting that was done by Weber. It's called the white man's burden, okay? Peter Weber. Now this particular painting, you know, you, uh, if you can see it, uh, it is that of a soldier, see? He's an Imperial Army soldier who's carrying a huge gunny sack on his shoulder, okay? Now, uh, this was also the title of a poem by Rudyard Kipling, okay? The White Man's Burden. Now, the white man's burden, in a sense, was that cumbersome, C-U-M-B-E-R-S-O-M-E, -E, that cumbersome but necessary, essential duty that the white man had of civilizing the savages, which is you people, all of you, okay? All of me and all of you had to be civilized by the white man. How? By bringing us culture, by bringing us religion, by bringing us social practices, okay? By bringing us art and ideas of aesthetics, okay? So social practices, governance practices, culture, religion, okay? Through all of these, so whatever indigenous knowledge existed in these lands, not just in India, but across the world in many places was denigrated. Understand? It was said that that is, that is mumbo jumbo. That is pagan nonsense. Understand? It is not scientific. And instead, whatever we believed in was supplanted by these ideas that the white man brought with him. Okay, so that is why it's called the white man's burden because they knew it's a very difficult task, but they have to do it to ensure that the savages can be, you know, made into cultural human beings, cultured human beings, I'm sorry. Okay, into cultured human beings so that they can recognize the one true religion, the one true governance, the one true science. Okay, so it was a gradual, systematic, yet rigorous repression of all that was native or indigenous. See, today, Indians, people in the continent of Africa, you know, uh, as well as dark complexion people the world over, spend millions of dollars on beauty products to become fairer, lovelier. Okay, then when they saw that, you know, men are walking around like really dark they introduced fair and handsome as well, okay? So that, and, and then, you know, you see all those matrimonial ads where everybody wants fair, homely, God-fearing girls. Now that is a very interesting mixture that you have. You should be fair. By homely, they mean people who will look after the home, but actually homely means ugly. Are there not many people know? Did you know? Oh, now you know, okay? <laughs> so you have fair, homely, God-fearing people, which means that girls, which means that why should you be afraid of God? What did you do? Okay, but yeah, that, that's the kind, but the fair thing always remains there. Okay, so uh, everything that is positive is seen as white. See, for example, we say out in the glorious sunshine, we should go and have a good time and things like that. But tell me, is the sunshine in India glorious? It is out to kill us, right? But in the West, 
where it is uh, places like England, Norway, etc., where you know places like Norway, Sweden, and all Finland, the light is on only for six months. It's daytime only for six months. Other six months, it's full time night, right? So places like that, they love the sunshine. It's cool, but here it could cause melanoma. It could cause sunburn, dehydration. So why are we so up and about about this glorious sunshine? We don't want it. See, so you have Ritu Samhara. Okay, you have Ritu Samhara where, you know, there is the moonlight and there is this beauty and the beauty of moonlight, uh, you know, uh, when you're so full of desire can burn you and interesting things like that. Understand. But see, now we think, oh, Ritu Samhara, such a beautiful text and, you know, uh, it is so like totally sensuous. How many of you have studied it? I think Kwame English has studied, right? Yes. People are like, oh my God. Okay, so um, this this text would be would be frowned upon, okay, by uh, uh, the the people who first came to conquer India. They would consider it to be over sensuous. They would consider it typical of of people such as us. Understand? So I'll come to that. Yeah, that's the white man's burden for you. One second, please. So yes, so we should understand that what began as a religious mission, okay, there were a number of missionaries who had sailed to places such as India in order to make a difference, India, Africa, you know, China, places like that, to make a difference, to bring the word of the one true God to, to these places where, you know, paganism and weird practices existed. But what began as a religious mission had actual political undertones. Understand? We know the, the workings of the English East India Company, which went on, you know, to become master of most of India until the great uprising of 1857, upon which the British government formally took over. Right? So it was it was a mission with political undertones. Okay. Now the origins of, of the processes of colonization and imperialism, uh, you know, have been in the practices of uh, the Roman Empire. Okay, I don't know uh, from your time with Julius Caesar, if you remember that, Julius Caesar and Pompey, etc., have come back to Rome from their conquests full, you know, with sacks full of gold. They have brought slaves, they have brought tributes. See, that bringing in of wealth, okay, that was a very important thing. So these political conquests were not merely for expanding the empire, it was for the sake of establishing an important transnational network. Understand, transnational network of goods that, that had to traverse the, the length and breadth of the empire. So goods from Egypt, goods from Alexandria would find their way into Rome and vice versa. So for the Romans, it was also important that you know trade relations existed here. This is the pattern that was followed by Western imperialists down the line. Okay, now we uh, how how this you know political uh, sorry post colonial practice I'm sorry how the colonial practices were imposed were through a process of cultural denigration which I had earlier mentioned to you and this process of cultural denigration also engendered a very important idea and that is of the other, O capital, the other, okay? So who is the other? What is the other? That is a very important question in, in post-colonial literatures, okay? So the other is anybody, simply put, the other is anybody who is not us, who does not subscribe to the same ideas who does not subscribe to the same ideological bank as us. Okay, other is also somebody who is our binary opposite. Okay, now the word binary is very important. It's a term that you see in computer science and so on. Binary is what? One or zero. There are just two possibilities, one or zero. Similarly, the othering also engenders, uh, you know, a, a sense of alienation based on the binary. That is nature 
represented by the natives. Culture that is represented by the colonizers. Okay, so night, day, dark, light, nature, culture. See, that kind of a, a deviation would happen. Okay, so this process of othering, I will be coming to that in greater detail down the line, was, was one of the ways in which the, the colonial mind ensured that it was able to establish a sense of superiority over the colonized. Hmm? So the othering was very crucial to the process of colonization. Now this you might recognize as what? What might this be? The world map, excellent. Can you see Greenland on top? Can you see uh, the United States and Canada to one side? Can you see Africa? Yes, uh, yeah, okay. So this is how, you know, the world map looks, right? What is this then? This is whose world? Is this a world map? No, it is not, ma'am, no. I don't know which world this is. See, this is how the world actually looks. Understand? This is how, the, this is actually the real shape of the earth. Look at the size of Africa. Right? Here is Africa. Here is Africa. Look at the size of it. There is America there. Here is America. I mean, North America, right? So you should understand that the process of colonization does not just settle with, you know, going somewhere, conquering them, then starting to trade with them. No, it is also ideological. It is ideological. And in order to, you know, impose that ideology, it is very important to perform culturally, cartographically, cartograph has to do with the map, cartographical, you know, representations such as this, understand? So then, you know, what, what happens is that people think, oh, they're so big. See, there was a time when people believed that the earth was the center of the universe, that the sun actually revolved around the earth. Oh, you didn't know that? Or you believe that? So the, the sun, people believe that, the sun actually revolved around the earth. Understand that earth was a center. And you know, you know that there are, uh, you know, texts that proclaim that man is God's most superior creation. Right? That God made us in his image. Did you ask him? Do you think God wants to look like you? Certainly not. Absolutely not. Okay. So, but these are the ways in which, you know, human beings try to feel better about themselves so that they can lord it over other people. I made the image of God, so I am better than you. Therefore, aha, uh -huh. you see, this is how it happens. So, then what comes into play? Look at the map. Look at this idea of God being made in the, I mean, sorry, man being made in the image of God. Look at all of these things and you realize that it is all in the gaze, in your eyes. So that is what is called colonial gaze. Okay, the colonial gaze is a very important stage in, in, you know, in the process of colonization. How the colonizer views the colonized will determine, uh, you know, their interactions. So often, often people are, you know, are termed exotic. Like, you know, you have uh, people such as uh, Flaubert, the French writer, who has written about this woman called Kuchuk Hanum. You will come to it if you're studying Orientalism, right? And, you know, he has given such a, a, an exotic portrayal of this dancer, okay? She's exotic, she's, she's mind blowing and she dances so mesmerizingly. Okay, you have, uh, you know, so, uh, people such as the Arabs being called a lazy. Understand? There's a stereotype. Okay, so what, what has, uh, has, has happened through the colonial gaze is a process of stereotyping. Understand? Which makes it easy to carry out negotiations for the colonizers. Okay, so they say, oh, exotic people, lazy people, 
cunning. See, Arabs could be called cunning. They could be called lazy. Indians are called lazy. They are called cunning. Then sensuous. All the Indian women are so sensuous. Okay, most of the pictures, postcards, etc., would have woman lying on couch. That's how they called it: woman lying on couch, woman enjoying afternoon siesta, woman eating from a bowl of fruits. This is how all of these things used to be. Understand? So that that idea of sensuous. Okay, uh, I will show you some pictorial representations soon enough. Now. So what we see are, you know, there's a certain sense of colonial anxiety that also accompanies the colonial gaze, okay? The anxieties of reformation, that is, we have to reform them. We have to improve them. We have to show them the truth. We have to show them the, the path of enlightenment. See, these kind of ideas. Then the anxieties of cultural assertion. We, the, the colonizer is better than the colonized who are lazy, who are sensuous, who are cunning, who are thieving people, understand? So, you know, there's a sense of cultural assertion that is there of superiority, okay? So colonial anxieties are many, okay? They have to be culturally, morally superior to the, to the colonized. There is this instance where, you know, they were planning to raise the marriageable age of girls from 10 to 12 long ago don't worry you're like what we didn't get married <laughs> so from from the age of 10 they wanted to make it 12 and then uproar broke out all across india okay people prominent uh, public uh, you know voices nationalists said this is a plot to ruin the culture of india and people were like uh, the british said what it is not and then the indians said see you are educating your women to dance with strange men okay we indians are not like that so don't bring those practices to us seriously this is what was said understand the the, the idea i mean the the topic of colonial law and uh, you know uh, indian practices is another session altogether so post colonial literatures or post colonial literatures okay sometimes you will see it as written as one post-colonial literatures, sometimes uses a post-colonial literatures. Hmm? Now, post-colonial literatures refers to the genre as such. That is, uh, you know, uh, the, the various interactions, social, political histories, everything that we've been talking so far, okay? Whereas post-colonial literatures could refer to the period after, the literatures written after 1945, which is the time when most of the colonies of Europe and America began to get their freedom. Like India got in 1947, uh, Pakistan also got in 1947, you know, all, all of those, okay? Now, post-colonial literatures or post-colonial literatures, as the case may be, they narrate the histories of place, space, and bodies, okay? What was a place, understand? What space, what use is a particular space being put to? understand what 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 does it signify like see when the Taj Mahal had been built it was what a tomb for Mumtaz Mahal the, what did you think he went to have tea there every evening. Taj Mahal is not, not the hotel I'm talking about the Taj Mahal in Agra yes so the Taj Mahal was a tomb for his wife today what is it it's a tourist attraction, eighth wonder of the world. It is a marvel of Mughal architecture. It is a symbol of our heightened culture. Ah. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to refer to uh, some of the dubiouser origins of uh, you know, the Taj Mahal ka name and what lies beneath it or above it. I don't, I don't want to talk about it, okay? And it is an architectural marvel. The Yamuna flows under it, but you know, does not do anything to it. Uh, all kinds of things like that. Understand? So. Look at that, understand? So histories of place, space, bodies, okay? So, uh, you know, how, how our bodies were viewed at one point of time, how we have been trying to pull our bodies out of those views, how we view those bodies that once viewed us. This is very confusing because of full of bodies. But uh, look at it this way. The white man would, or white woman would pass by on a horse and we'd be like, oh, they are so white. How did they get so white? 
And then they'll be like, you have to believe in Christ. But then, okay, I'm, I'm just joking here. Okay, so, uh, but, but what happened is that, you know, they viewed our bodies with either a mixture of desire, uh, suspicion, or, you know, they, they would view it with a sense of mistrust or as something that could be exploited, cheap labor, slave labor. Look at what happened to, uh, in the case of the Africans, uh, you know, slavery. Those bodies were looked upon as bodies that could be enslaved, correct? Yes. Then comes a time when now all of these Europeans are traveling to India and they are being advised to cover up properly and walk around. Understand? So uh, on one hand, come on. Okay. On the other hand, it's like, you know, we don't have uh, our self-control. Sometimes it's shown like that. Sometimes it is shown as this is against our culture to walk around in this heat wearing a singlet and shorts. You, you see that? So this is how, depending on where people are, their bodies undergo changes, okay, of perception, perspective. So the post-colonial literatures are a process of writing back or rewriting. It is a crucial form of resistance. Writing back is, see, once upon a time, they wrote about the Indians, they wrote about the Africans, they wrote about the people of the Middle East in extremely exotic terms. It's like there's no tomorrow. They have, you know, our bazaars are full of strange things. There was a great exhibition that was held in London, you know, uh, where all of those strange things of the empire were brought in, things from India as well. Understand, India was a land of Maharajas, and you know uh, there are there are certain accounts where you know it has been written, travelers' accounts written about women who mate with tigers and give birth to children who look like mountains within a period of a few days. These these are actual accounts. Understand? Uh, seriously? Okay, so it's, it's a very crucial form, this process of writing back, see, where then now what we do is that we have started writing back in the language of the colonizer. See, again, the word language becomes very crucial. Look at the terms, oh, one second, what is the time? So these are some of the terms that we need to come to terms with, okay? One is colonialism, see the very basis. As you can see, when we say colonized, colonial, colonizer, we only imagine India at the most Africa, but there have been you know, places such as South America, Canada, Australia, that, that have also been colonized and have suffered terrible consequences of these colon colonial expeditions. Like what happened in Canada, you know, where children were taken away to these special schools, native children taken away to special schools. And then, you know, nobody heard from many of them ever again until they were found to have died of abuse, exposure, maltreatment, God knows what. And it's only now, recent times that, you know, people have tendered formal apologies. Canada has its own form of, of colonization as well, okay? If you look at the history of the ship, the Komagata Maru, K-O-M-A-G-A-T-A-M-A-R-U, the Komagata Maru, you will realize that, uh, you know, the, the, the colonial tendencies of Canada were not that far off either, okay? Now, colonization is essentially a very, violent process. One cannot, uh, you know, imagine uh, colonialism taking place without violence. Understand? It's a process of violence that finally ends in exploitation. Understand? And we also have to, uh, you know, recognize the fact that there have been heavy legacies, cultural baggage, you know, that the colonizers have left behind them. We look at the railways and we say, oh, the British build that. We look at the dam and say, oh, the British build that. Then we look at Ambani's house and we say, oh, Ambani built that. <laughs> Understand? But, uh, you know, there is also this process that happens in reverse. Okay? Like the other day, uh, you know, I was watching this uh, conversation that 
Vikram was having with regard to Pony in Selvan, the movie. Anybody remembers the movie? That you remember. Okay. So Pony in Selvan, where he was talking about the Tanjavur temple, which has the biggest, the tallest gopuram in the world. And he says the stone, the single stone that sits on top of that gopuram is 80 tons, eight zero, 80 tons. How did it get there? Apparently they built a ramp of six kilometers to get it there in the time of the Cholas. And the place has survived six earthquakes. Nothing's happened to the temple, okay? Because of the way that it has been constructed, considering the possibility of an earthquake, understand? So what we have to understand is that these are processes of writing back. These are processes of resistance. When an Indian writes, when he uses his language, okay, when he uses those, those cultural systems available to him, when he brings in personal, social, political histories together and presents it in a book to you, it could be the Midnight's Children, it could be the God of Small Things, it could be the Suitable Boy, what you have to understand is that it's a process of writing back. It's a process of showing people that this is what we are actually capable of. Understand? It's an act of resistance. And for that, global, local, personal histories all have to be read. Okay? The next one is identity, okay? Now, identity is a very complex term, okay? Because it essentially, you know, uh, is, is what makes you, okay? It constitutes you, okay? So it is very difficult to imagine an identity that does not bring in an element of colonialism, understand? So see, uh, when you say your name, your full name, or you, you know, add your family's history behind it, you will somewhere or the other associate who you were at a certain point of time. Understand? Communities such as the Parsis, the Anglo-Indians, okay, uh, people who have been, you know, uh, given titles such as Rao Bahadur, right? All of them, and not only that, not just them, but us as well, in terms of our religion, in terms of our language, in terms of the agency that was available to us at the time of colonization. Understand? So see, uh, all of these things become very important and all of this contributes to our identity being very, very fragmented, okay? Our identities are not unified, they are fragmented. I am traditional, but I am modern, okay? I pray to God, but I believe in science, okay? Uh, I ride a scooter, but I will, you know, whenever I see a place of worship, I will bow my head. I will love my mother-in-law as I love my own mother, but I will go to work, see? All of these identities that are there. So who exactly are you? That question has to be answered from the point of view of the post-colonial body, okay? So these identities that you have, they are informed by, as I told you, national. I am an Indian, local. I am from Kerala, from Trivandrum. Personal identity. This is my name, my caste, my religion. All of these markers, my gender, very, very important. See, our current point of view with regard to gender has been a legacy from our colonial times. Understand? So all of these things mark affiliation to a certain set of people. So immediately, you know, once you have identified all of this, then you will go and sit with a certain set of people. And that is who you become. Now, another term, hybridity. Okay, now hybrid comes from botany, where you know you are able to mix and match two kinds of plants and you, you're creating a hybrid variety. It could be better, it could be resistant, it could be more colorful, it could be more productive, it could be all of these things, understand? But uh, in the colonial times, these kind of hybridities were not welcomed. 
hybridity meant where you know there's an interaction between the two races the indians and the british for example okay that was frowned upon hmm? but you have the critic homi baba who thought that hybridity was a very empowering process okay because then you do not have one single identity you occupy that interesting in between space that comes about between two cultures okay so there are possibilities of multiplicity and polyphony what polyphony is uh, let's say a number of different sounds or noises or presences or identities polyphony comes from music Oh, uh, yeah, I'll just read that to you. Hybridity presents distinct possibilities for cultural multiplicities and polyphony. It's there below, it can't come completely. Okay. Hybridity presents distinct possibilities for cultural uh, multiplicities and polyphony. Polyphony is a very, very crucial factor as far as post colonial studies are concerned because it allows it accepts it recognizes the fact that there is more than one identity there is more than one identity that the that you know when people say for example they say oh you have fever have paracetamol right you have fever have paracetamol paracetamol is the universal solution for fever correct today's world that is exactly what we are fighting against this idea of uniformity of monotony understand where it is believed that one thing you impose it it is applicable to everybody they do not take into account age they do not take into account gender race they do not take into account cultural differences right now mimicry mimicry is is uh, something you know it's, it's kind of funny as well in the sense that you know people uh you know take up you know the the role of the colonizer to be so aspirational that they become the colonizer themselves understand so it is a process of out britishing the british that is what we called it okay so you take so much of effort uh in order to mimic your colonizer that you lose your own identity, your indigenous identity. It doesn't look that appealing. Understand? Now, the reasons for this could be a desire for upward mobility. Okay? That is, don't want to be with the country peoples. I want to be, you know, like civilized and polished. So that is what I'm going to do. I don't want to have anything to do with these people. Understand? So the mimicry you know has a, a direct link to with modernity as well understand because people believe that modernity is the one way of achieving that upward mobility those aspirations this comes from idealizing the colonizer their cultural practices their their social practices their political and economic practices to that great extent okay like recently i saw this um television series it came on netflix the thing with this girl called devi they're in america <laughs> tell me again never ah never have i ever there are about four or five seasons no oh my god <laughs> okay ah so uh yeah never have i ever in that the father uh, is talking to the mother, the wife who's pregnant. Hmm? And she says, I don't want to be here. Everybody is nasty to me. I want to go back. I want to go back. And he's like, what did we say? We have come to America to see to it that our daughter will get the best education possible. You should see their textbooks. Oops, this is being recorded. But yes, okay. So see, they went to America, they decided to brave racism or social ostracism, everything for the sake of giving their daughter the best education. From India they went. Understand? This, these are the ways, you know. So mimicry, modernity, those aspirations that exist, you know, they're, they're, it's kind of a direct relationship. Yes. 
Now, othering, as I told you, okay? Othering is the binary opposite of us. The other is anybody who is not us. And, you know, it comes about as, as an idea that is created by the colonizer to impose those characteristics that he refuses to recognize in himself or in themselves. Like, I am not lustful, you, you are lustful. I am not uh, cunning, you are cunning. I am not greedy, you are. See? So often it is the native who is made the other through a very conscious process of construction. Okay, so the identity of the other is created in the mind of the colonizer. And that is imposed and all further interactions are seen only from that point. That is the thing, okay, now. So see, and this process of alienation is very essential for the colonizer because they need to be able to believe in their propaganda. They have to say, see, suppose they come to India and we are building uh, temples, 80 ton of stone on top, and they be like, oh, um, I see. In the, in the, we'll just go back. In the parallel, too. So what do they do? They say, oh, this is all nonsense. Uh, you know, you should look at our modern architecture with spires and palace and moat and, you know, small holes to fire guns from. We are better. That's how it is. Understand? So that is how you create the other, the bogeyman figure, B-O-G-E-Y-M-A-N. Understand? See, when you were children, I don't know if you were, ch uh, you were children, of course, but I don't know whether, when you were children, did people tell you, don't go sit there, don't get out of the house on your own. That the one who will come to get you, that person is the other in your life. Understand? So next time, you see somebody going to catch children, you can say, oh, that is the other. Okay. Yes. So see, these are some lines I have for you to substantiate what we were talking so far. This is from the heart of darkness. Okay. You can read it for yourself. Anybody wants to read aloud? Look at Jane Eyre. In the deep shade at the further end of the room, a figure ran backwards and forwards. You need to imagine this. A figure ran backwards and forwards in a dark room. Hmm? What it was, whether beast or human being, one could not at first sight tell. It groveled seemingly on all fours. It snatched and growled like some strange wild animal. But it was covered with clothing and a quantity of dark grizzled hair, wild as a mane, hid its head and face. She's talking about a woman here. It's a woman called Grace Poole. Okay, Grace Poole, who has been, you know, uh, told to Jane Eyre, if you've read the story, they've been told to Jane Eyre that this is a woman who lived in this house and went kind of mad. So don't really pay much attention to her. It's okay. Stay away from her. Understand, but actually she is the first wife of the uh, of of Rochester. I'm sorry, of of uh, this man, nobleman called Rochester, and he just did not like her, and gradually she declined into the state of madness. Okay, but what is said by Rochester is that she was too exotic. This place could not enchant her. She longed for all those uh, you know sunny shores from whence she came. She had, she had been married from the Caribbean islands. See, in England at that point of time, what would happen is that if there were two sons, the eldest son would get the entire property, the title, the land, the, the castle, everything. The second son was given condolences and sent away. So he had to go marry somebody so as to get the wife's wealth. That's how it was. So this man, because he was a second son, he traveled off. You know, he went away to the Caribbean islands. He meets this family. They are quite rich. Uh, he doesn't mind the girl. So he marries, comes back and realizes that his father and his elder brother are dead. Understand? Moral of the story. 
marry only for the right reasons. <laughs> okay. Now you say, oh, oh, ini yan hindi. What will I do now? Okay, I don't like her anymore. I'll just put her somewhere. Understand? And then, you know, he meets this governess who comes to teach a child in his house French. Now, how did this child come about? This child is a daughter of an exotic Parisian dancer that he met in Paris. And, you know, she died. So she, he brought the girl home. There's no indication that it is his daughter. He was just feeling sorry. So he brought because he has a good heart. It's like, so girl is there. So Jane has to come and teach her. Jane is teaching. Now Jane is somebody with no opinion, no future, uh, no parents, no money. And this house is her shelter. And she's white, by the way. This graceful person is not white. She's mulatto. She's half and half. Understand? She is white. Thank you, Kukuma. So he's like, interesting. And uh, he proposes to her. She accepts. And then when they were going to go to the church to get married, a man comes and says, stop. This wedding cannot take place. Normally, it is the bride's boyfriend. But in this case, it was Grace Poole's brother who comes and says, he's already married to my sister. You cannot do this. So then Jane Eyre says, what? Or an equivalent of Chadicha Guruvai Rappa. <laughs> and uh, she goes away. Okay. She goes away and she walks and walks and walks. And then, you know, what happens is that she, uh, you know, walks through a lot of grassland and then she collapses. When she comes to her senses, she's in a cabin where she is being taken care of by a couple of women or one woman anyway, and a man. And that man, is, you know, in some weird way, they are related to each other. Okay, and then he says, I am going to go to India to improve the lives of the people there, you people. Okay, so would you like to come with me as my companion, Jane? Then Jane thinks very hard. She's like, then I'll have to go to India. There must be malaria. No, she didn't, it's not written that, but I'm thinking, okay, there's a problem. Plus, Indians must be quite boring and he will be saying religious things all the time. So she, she looks out of the window and suddenly, in the sunlight, dying sunlight, she can hear a voice call out. What does the voice say? Let me see if you have any imagination or romance. Absolute. Say it louder. Yes. The voice says, Jane. Immediately, Jane packs up bag, luggage, everything. And she goes to the house, mansion. And she finds that everything has burned down. It's a classic example of Pavi Chalandanam Padalo. <laughs> so she's like, um, what happened? And then they say that the mad woman went totally mad. The mad woman in the attic, which is a very important uh, title of a very important book by Gilbert and Gubar. Hmm? Title was taken from the novel, not the other way around, please. Okay. So the mad woman in the attic, she went totally mad one day and she set fire to everything. And then she climbed onto the roof and she danced up on the roof. And the great man that Rochester was, he climbed up the roof to save her, but he couldn't. Everything came collapsing down. I think he went to push her. <laughs> he must be like, you know, never mind. He put in, this is my only chance. So anyway, so this happens and everything is gone. So then she goes to the house that Rochester is now living in. He's kind of blinded in one eye or something. I mean, he can't see altogether, but uh, he goes, but he can feel her presence. And then she says, did you call out to me? And he says, I did one evening. I said, Jane. And she's like, that's it. <laughs> and uh, then the end it says, reader, I married him. So, you know, they, they have a, uh, he can see a bit out of one eye after that. So, you know, this, this could be used by uh, Indian parents to tell you what difference you can make in the life of your husband. Ah. But see, the, the story, this is the story of Jane Eyre. This story was read by a woman called Jean Rice many, many decades later. And Jean Rice read the story and said, what? How could they do this to that woman in the attic? So I am going to rewrite her story. And she created this beautiful, beautiful novel called The Wide Sargasso Sea. The Wide Sargasso Sea. It's a remarkable novel that narrates everything 
from the point of view of this woman who people call Grace Poole, who was named Bertha Mason, a common, dead, boring name by her husband, whereas her actual name was Antoinette. Antoinette. Understand? So instead of being called, he didn't want to call her Antoinette because it seemed too exotic and foreign to him. So he said, I will call you Bertha. Go. That's what he did. So see your names, children, your names are of great importance. The identity that you have through your name, it is very important. Understand, by taking her name away, he took her identity away, her memory away, her past away, her entire life away. You know, in, in White Sagasso, see, it is said that, that that time before she burns the house down, she puts on a red dress that she once had when she was back in Jamaica. Understand? Red. Look at that color that she's, she's wearing. And she looks in the mirror and suddenly she remembers who she was. That's how she ends up putting the whole place to flames. Because why should she live in this lie with this name as nobody? Understand? That is the power of post-colonial literatures. It can seek to reclaim our histories. It can seek to reclaim our narratives. Understand? So um, I will uh, show you, uh, what's the time now? 11, thank you. Uh, so I guess we have time only for one video then. So yeah, I will show you a, a video that, you know, kind of takes us, um, that compounds or, or, you know, kind of agrees with what I have just uh, shown here. Yeah, it's from this uh, very famous movie, Indiana Jones. Okay, now this is a visit that has been, uh, that, you know, Indiana Jones makes to India. I'm screening it for you people there. Uh, please screen from number 60, uh, one second. I cannot imagine where in the world you put it One second. Uh, could you please post that? I should mute my mic here.
Yes, I I hope that we are very close to the lunch break now. Please eat well. Okay, so uh, coming back. I will be uh, very brief in what I have to say, which is, uh, yeah, to do with uh, what postcolonial studies aspires to do, hmm? or what do they? What does postcolonial studies and uh, postcolonial literatures and postcolonial criticism do? It rejects the universal significance of Western literature. See, uh, the West believes or tried to make us believe that what it wrote applied to all of humanity across people, across cultures, across languages and belief systems. Okay, so postcolonial literature, postcolonial criticism tries to tell us that that is not the case, that there are very, very heavy, very prominent, and at the same time, very subtle differences. Okay, postcolonial literatures, as well as criticism, tries to place an emphasis on multiple identities, on the possibility of polyphony, because multiculturalism is the way forward. Understand, trying to remain insular, I-N-S-U-L-A-R, trying to remain insular does not help, okay? It creates very rigid walls. Therefore, it is important to lay emphasis on multiple or, or hybrid identities. Also, it tries to point out the places where, you know, the literature of the colonized period has remained silent. Understand, look at what Jane Eyre talks about. Okay, look at uh, uh, things like Heart of Darkness, novels such as Heart of Darkness, all of these, you know, they're colonial silences. Okay, the, those spaces where people have not spoken about the fact that it was not a good idea after all understand then it reveals the pitfalls of structured language that is see we believe that when you say uh, i am so and so okay i am sonia that is correct when you say i is that is wrong understand but look at those possibilities that lie with, within you know these these beautiful hybridities of language that we create understand the beautiful, uh, give it to see how she will change it. Or, or her. Yeah. Uh, those beautiful hybridities of language that are made possible. Understand? So that is what, you know, uh, our uh, Salman Rushdie, in fact, burst into the Indian consciousness, you know, when he said, uh, when, when he wrote Midnight's Children, okay, that the way that he used language, it was absolutely beautiful. Understand? And he called it the chattification of language. So, you know, bring it all together, put it, mash it, change it. That's what makes all the difference. That's what he says. So language has to be hybridized. And as time goes by, we have been seeing that in regional as well as in Indian writings, in post-colonial literatures, basically. But there are three phases of post-colonial literature, which is adopt, adapt, and adapt. Okay, adopt is, you know, where you, you take up the language of the colonizer, okay? In Indian writing, what they did was they took up the, the stylistics and they applied Indian themes to it, okay? So you would have these beauteous descriptions of the sunrise and the sun and the people who are working in the fields and so on. That is how it was. Adapt is a bit more of an involved process wherein, you know, the, the nuances are taken up and, you know, it is adapted, okay? So the language of the colonizer is adapted to suit the themes of, uh, you know, the colonized or the native, okay? That is what is done. Adapt is when the colonized or the native is able to play with the colonizer's language where you know he makes it his own where another version of the language emerges which is culturally socially sensitive okay culturally and socially whose culture and whose society whose the natives or the colonized the 
the native or the colonizers the natives understand so when you write a novel today you would write something like you know meera was alone and she went to the kula kadavu and we be like what is kula kadavu you be like ah that is how i am adapted english understand see people uh, you know there have been some casual conversations that i have heard uh, when i used to travel by buses where there are two women who will be like uh, edi uh, income tax office il poyirunna illa avada commissioner illayirunnu pinne appurtha vittla penda karyam kettayirunno avada oru divorce nadakkan povva see how easily it just melts together and you have become so adept now i'm not saying that this is the best example that i've just recounted but this is the way that you know language has just come into our our language in such a way that we don't now recognize the difference understand we just don't recognize the difference puttupudi is written as puttupudi on our puttupudi packets dosha idli batter see look at the contrast puttupudi dosha idli batter it's it's like that and you can't do anything about it right yes so each uh, each represents that is the adopt adapt adapt each of these phrase uh, you know it represents a very very important understanding of uh, you know the the relationship between the colonizer and the colonized understand now see this is a uh, this is a paragraph from uh, god of small things look at that look at the second paragraph another bald fist slammed down on it and the bonnet closed chako rolled down his window and called out to the man who had done it thanks keto valare thanks ah what did he say <laughs> valare thanks similarly in god of small things itself you have this uh, small bitty papara para para pere kya enda parambel thurale chetne parambel it is there it is there understand why chal ari ha now see this is from ani salim's vanity bag all of these represent the adept face okay vanity oh i'm sorry please change it ha ah, vanity bag it's vanity bag bag is garden okay so vanity bag he asked without looking up from the register this is a jailer you mean bag he had never heard of our mohalla there you have the word mohalla okay maybe he had but didn't want to admit it no not bag bag b a g h as in mango bag see then this is from david deops at night all blood is black it's a he's a french senegalese writer who written a very powerful novel about you know the the wars in which senegalese and black soldiers had been enlisted to fight for france this is the french commander i have taken out only the relevant lines you the chocolats of black africa are naturally the bravest of the brave france admires you and is grateful see france so it's like the whole country is personified this is the black man speaking okay but i alpha ndaye i understand the true meaning of the captain's words the captain's france see he's not saying my france or france the captain's france wants us to play the savage when it suits them it need they need for us to be savage because the enemy is afraid of our machetes see look at that that is how it works so language as i told you is a is a great preoccupation in post colonial literatures uh, and and criticism okay how language is employed what it does how it works these are all crucial questions that post colonial writers and uh, theorists have worked on you have now increasingly you know number of translations coming from regional languages in india for example coming into english you have these uh, you know novels all over the world that that are being translated into english because they believe that there has to be a writing back that just as we have been given mansfield park jane ayer uh, 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 sons and lovers everything we should also give them 
something to study okay to know and learn about us to understand that there are complexities involved okay so it's an act of writing it's an act of resistance it's an act of reading now these are you know it's not an exhaustive list okay uh, but uh, these are the various writers and theorists okay So of course you have the big three: R. K. Narayan, Mulkaraj, Anand, Raja Rao. We should, I should also be have written um, Nirat C. Chaudhary. Okay, some of these writers you may recognize. Amos Tutola had burst into prominence because of a book that he wrote. Uh, uh, it's called the Palm Wine Drinkard, not drunkard, drinkard, and written it you know, in, a, in a very broken, fragmented kind of a language, thoroughly ungrammatical and so on, and it became a huge. uh you know fascination for the people okay chinua chi bi ben okri ngogi batyongo all of them african writers nigerian writers okay you have uh, abdul razak gurna okay uh, who uh, won the nobel then you have ama ata aidu who is again a woman writer very powerful voice with a novel called sister kill joy our sister kill joy then no violet bulawayo was in this novel called we need new names absolutely beautiful novel chimamanda ngozi adichi i'm sure you've heard of her purple hibiscus a half a yellow sun yeah then you have bernardine evaristo again winner of the booker prize black women writers who have written powerfully about the process of capturing claiming reclaiming one's identity then from pakistan bangladesh etc you have people such as babsi sidwa Khalid Hosseini, Numair Atif Chaudhry, has written a beautiful book called Babu Bangladesh. That's the only book he wrote. It took him ten years to write that, and uh, he died uh, before it could be published. But it is it is a terrific book that encompasses the ideas of Bangladeshi history, the independence movement, and the various periods of political turmoil in Bangladesh. Okay, you have Mohsin Hamid, you have Muhammad Hanif, you have Fatima Bhutto. okay people who have narrated their country's histories okay in a very succinct in a very personal manner and what they have done is that they have taken these histories and you know added it to the life of an ordinary person from the country and then presented it understand so look at that so you are reading history in a sense of the term at the same time it is fiction okay so uh, there are beautiful books like but mohammad hanif has written called our lady of alice bhatti case of exploding mangoes and so on okay then these are the various theorists edward said orientalism which again talks about the them and the us the other and us differences uh, talks about the orient and the occident and how all of these identities are constructs they are constructs if you take a map you will never be able to find the orient and the occident orient is the east occident is the west o c c i d e n t you will never find them anywhere you have lepol sengor who talked about negritude that state of blackness understand you have ame sezer you have ashcroft garrett tiffin who have uh, spoken you written a book called the empire writes back which again documents these acts of narrative resistance okay uh, documents the act of narrative resistance gayatri spivak uh, henry louis gates benedict anderson has spoken about imagined communities see all of you think you are indians correct and you belong to india and you are from the community of indians it's a community that you have imagined you imagine that outside of this building there are indians and that you know you are all joined together by common cultural political social economic ties but you don't know them you don't know the ward member of the next ward do you but you are all indians so that's why you imagine that community and that coming together you know it makes a, a, a very potent narrative for post colonial literatures okay you have homi baba mentioned him earlier salman rushdi again who talked about those far away lands and how we imagine those those communities and homelands imagined homelands understand so in short post colonial literatures you know document the narratives 
okay in any form for that matter textual non textual form of of the people their lives their histories and how exactly it is that they came about understand and those practices that you know we have propagated continued and carried on into the future in the creation of this world that we live in here and now so on one hand it is that you know overarching imperial hegemonic forces that come down and bear down upon us on the other hand are these fragmentary identities of of you know region language history personhood all of these that resist this overarching hegemony and create mini narratives instead of mega narratives okay so that is it we have been constantly evolving uh, i have just talked about novels and fiction here but theater poetry all of these are are very dynamic spaces okay and most importantly if you think about the direction that post colonial literature is taking today it is in the area of ecology okay uh, and uh, you know life narratives okay ecology and life narratives particularly travel narratives okay ecology life narratives particularly travel narratives okay these are the new and emerging areas in uh, post colonial literatures thank you no no don't bother uh so we have concluded um i hope i haven't taken too much time if there are questions please feel free to ask me one second please everybody yes hello yes uh i'm sorry i, I don't think that was from the back here yeah, please um any doubts does anybody here have any questions okay Sonia, ma'am. Yes. Good morning, Anjali here. Ah, hi, Anjali. And, hi. Uh, thank you. Indeed, a power-packed session on post-colonial literature. This one hour has taken us on a journey to the colonies and the predicament of projection and for the colonial days. When we were casual in creating the hungry post-colonial literature. As the theme of Anglo-Indian post-colonial literature, now as students, we become more conscious in handling these terms. Yet, the writing back wheel is set in motion among our students. Our very dearest resource person of the day, Professor Sonia Gennaya, all the teachers of both the colleges, and my very dear friends at both ends. I am here to share a brief conversation as well as to deliver the vote of thanks. Now, to give a feedback, I mean, it's such a very important point in the session. Starting from the key term post colonialism, we travel through colonialism, othering identity, identity and uniqueness. The interesting part of it, Sonia, was your way of meeting the term with greater relevance and matter. They are often adapting and adapting spaces of language in post colonial literature were also made very clear. We thank you sincerely, ma'am, for such an educative session. I take this opportunity to thank the coordinators from both the colleges for organizing this session. After this power-packed session, we eagerly look forward to the next 
fun. Thank you all. So on behalf of All Saints, we also thank you. It was wonderful having you on the other side and it was wonderful talking to our students as well. <laughs> thank you very much. This is our hall. So these are students from St. Joseph's College, in case you want to say hello. All right then, thank you very much.